The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the ninth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. And the bulletin is a little maybe confusing. That's my own fault there, giving the text to Peggy the way I did. But it's uh, Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 35. We'll be reading through chapter 10, verse 23 this morning. So Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 35. There'll be a couple verses missing from the wall, so you'll be totally lost if you don't read it in your own Bible. (laughs) Totally lost. Matthew chapter 9, beginning with verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it, but if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them. For they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death. And a father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, Heavenly Father, Christ our Lord, Holy Spirit, help us, God, to hear what you would have us to hear. Help us to hear you calling us to do what you would have us to do. Give us the strength, O God, to do it, so that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, back several years ago, when I first started hanging around in churches, uh, there was a young woman who came to speak at my home church. Now, I was going to a very conservative, rural, Southern Baptist church at this time, so she didn't come to preach. 
She didn't come to preach, and she wasn't really allowed in the pulpit. So we met in the fellowship hall where she was going to share her testimony. That's what you say, you know. You don't let the girls preach. You let them share as if they were bringing cookies or something. I can remember sitting in a brown metal folding chair at a gray plastic table and listening to this woman who I don't think could have been any more than 25, maybe just out of college, maybe seminary. She told us about her time she had spent with this group of women in Africa in some small little village. And I remember she was dressed as if she had just got off the plane from there. A long skirt, faded t-shirt, hair was done up in some sort of colorful cloth. And she had slides. Pictures of her experience of living with these women in this village. The picture showed her and several of them plowing little small plots of land with some very basic implements. No tractors, no mules, no men, just these women. There were pictures of them planting seeds in this plowed field. Pictures of them watering the seeds, watching them grow. Even, even pictures of when they had matured and they went out to, to reap their harvest. And I remember her talking about the importance of teaching these women in these villages how to grow their own food, how to sustain themselves and their families, and how she was doing the Lord's work by walking alongside these women in such a, uh, such a journey as this. And then as she went to close her presentation, she recited these words. It may have been the first time I heard them. I don't know. But she recited these words from Jesus that we've read together this morning. Words I'm sure many of you have heard more than once. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. It was powerful. She had just shown us about a literal harvest, telling us about the call to come. And then she said, words from Jesus. The harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. It was an invitation to join her in the kingdom work in Africa. I think we just applauded. Maybe passed the plate around for a love offering. And then thanked her for sharing with us. That's how I've most often heard these words from Jesus. After some missionary clicks through all of her slides... After some prison chaplain has shared stories about the need for more folks to share Jesus in prisons. After some evangelist has, has blown through a sermon and wants to invite folks to surrender their lives to full-time Christian service. That's how I've heard it. As a recruitment call. A plea to, to join the work because there's so much work to do and not enough people to do it. So come on. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. That's how I've always heard it. I have a feeling that's the way you've heard it. But I wonder, let me ask you, when you've heard it that way, whether from a missionary, an evangelist, a chaplain, somebody, when you heard them say, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, did they go on to read the rest of the story? Because I kind of doubt it. I mean, I don't think I've ever heard it that way. And I have a hunch. I have a hunch it's because if you read the rest of the story, if you read all of the words that we read this morning, the rest of Jesus' words here, I imagine the line of folks joining up got smaller and smaller until it shrank away to nothing. I mean, look at what Jesus is saying. He's not just posting a job in the Galilean classified. It's something altogether different, something that requires more than a nine-to-five commitment, and surely something that requires more than a single hour on Sunday morning. Jesus, Jesus gives his disciples, he, calls them, he gives them the authority to do all the things that he's been doing, which is nice, I suppose. I mean, Matthew starts it that way, telling us Jesus is going around doing all these things, and then he says he gave them authority, and that's nice. But then again, that's Jesus, right? I mean, I could show up at a five-star restaurant and the chef say, you have authority now over the whole kitchen. You have my permission. Do with it whatever you please. That doesn't mean that they're all of a sudden going to get filet mignon and not peanut butter foldovers, because that's what they're getting if it's me. Oh, sure, Jesus modeled the way for them. Jesus gave them authority. But Matthew says in verse 35 that Jesus modeled it in a lot of different ways and all through the Gospels, really. 
But just because someone models it for you, just because they've shown you how to do it, doesn't mean you can pick right up and do it without any real struggle, right? I mean, you can show someone how to do something and give them the certification and authority to do it, and they can still screw it up. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've seen it in your own line of work. New hire, fresh out of school, fresh out of college, comes in, has got all the certificates, all the degrees, all the, all the things they need, the best references. Yet on the first day of the job, you find them there in the break room, sobbing into their cup of coffee. Because they really weren't prepared for all of this. It happened. Jesus models the work for his disciples, models it for us, gives us the authority to do it. And before anyone can ask questions for clarification, oh, Jesus, I can see Peter, Jesus, I have a question. Before he can even do that, he gives them the job description. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, now I want to stop right there for just a minute. Some will say that Jesus tells his followers to go to the uh, lost sheep of the house of Israel because salvation has come first to the Jews or, or because Jesus has some preference for his own people. And maybe. But I think it's something else. I think it's something more difficult. Because you see, it's a whole lot easier to say to those on the outside, guess what? You're in. That's a whole lot easier. That's good news. People will listen to that. It's a whole lot harder to say to those on the inside, hey, guess what? They're in too. It's a lot harder to do that. It's a lot easier for the poor to hear how God is going to provide for them than it is for the rich to hear, hey, God wants you to provide for them. It's a lot easier to hear God's words of liberation and justice when you've been knocked down and kept down. It's a whole lot harder to listen when you're in a place of power and privilege. So maybe... Maybe Jesus told them, go first to the lost house of Israel because they need the most convincing. Because many of them already thought they had it all figured out. I don't know. Maybe. But Jesus carries on with the job description. As you go, proclaim the good news. What's the good news? The kingdom of heaven has come near. I can hear them because I'd have said this too. Now, Jesus, I don't like to talk to folks, especially strangers most especially about religion. Now maybe, maybe Jesus, if this proclamation came with some judgment now, you know, I could do that. If I could point out their shortcomings, their sins, the things they do that I don't, then maybe I can get behind it. Maybe then I'd be glad to proclaim something. But I don't really feel comfortable talking, proclaiming the good news. But Jesus says, cure the sick. Now, 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 hang on right there. That one, I, I, no, cure the sick. We've got hospitals. We've got doctors for that sort of thing. If folks are sick, let them go to the doctor. Let them make an appointment. If they can't afford it, well, I, I'm sure there are free clinics or payment plans or something. But I can't cure them. I can't do it. What can I do really? I can't pay for their doctors and medication or change the way things are. I suppose I'll just have to pray for them. Raise the dead, Jesus says. Raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Now that's just Bible time talk, right? I mean, y'all know what I mean when I say Bible time talk. Like the little storybooks you see in doctor's offices. Got the, you know, Jesus walking around. Well, it's just Bible time talk. Raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. We're smarter than that sort of thing, right? I know good and well I can't raise anybody from the dead. I've tried. To walk out into that cemetery across the road, to call up old friends out of the grave. I can't do it. I don't think you can either. Could it be, though, that I have the power to give someone a reason to live? Could it be that I have the power to bring them back from the dangerous precipice of self-loathing and hopelessness? Could it be that Christ has given me the power and authority to welcome lepers back into the community, to welcome back those who've been ostracized, to cast out the demons I've put in others, demons of my own creation that have kept me from seeing them as the full image of God, from including them in the full family of God. Could it be that we have the power to raise the dead 
than just a kind act and an empowering word of love to a stranger. You received without payment, Jesus said. Give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Take nothing with you. I mean, when I leave the house in the morning, I pack my pockets. I mean, I got a pocket knife, a cell phone, a a, a handkerchief. I mean, when I leave the house, I'm ready to go, and I may just be going to the store. Take nothing. We're going to be gone for a while, Jesus. Take nothing with you. Don't be prepared. I might need a little walking around money. I might have to stop at a store and get a Coke and a honey bun. Nope. Take nothing with you. How in the world am I supposed to feel comfortable in this long-term work if I can't even take a pair of clean underwear, Jesus? That's what it says. You can laugh. That's what it says. Don't take, two, two, don't take clean underwear. Whatever town or village you enter, he says, find out who in it is worthy. Stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet as you leave that house or town. Because I tell you what, and it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, Jesus says, on the day of judgment than for their own, for that town. So not only is this work going to be hard and demanding, seemingly impossible, like raising the dead, but I'm also going to have to do it without provisions. I'm going to have to do it without expecting to get paid. My wages depend on the people I serve and how they're going to pay me, right? That doesn't seem, that doesn't seem right. But hang on, uh, it, it doesn't get better. Jesus goes on to describe the working conditions. See, I'm sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. Thanks, Jesus. Be wise as serpents, innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils. And they'll flog you in their synagogue. They're going to beat you at church. You'll be dragged the four governors, not taken quietly, not read your Miranda rights, not sat in the back of a squad car and quietly eased off down some back alley. Dragged, he says, before governors and kings. When they hand you over, don't worry, don't worry. That's easy for Jesus to say, isn't it? Don't worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say because you're going to be worried. I'm worried every Sunday. You're going to be worried. For what you are to say will be given to you at that time. It's not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother. Not just, I don't like you, I don't know you anymore, I've heard what you're preaching and I think you're crazy. No, brother will betray brother, Jesus says, to death. And a father his child. That's not great for Father's Day, but it's there. Children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you, everybody will love you. Everybody will go around singing your praises. Everybody will erect statues of you in their homes. Staying glad. No. You will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Sounds lovely. Who wants to sign up? Really, I I can put the sheet down on the table now. Who wants to sign up? I'm really surprised, I am, that the 12 didn't say, nope, I'm going to go back to the fishing boats. Is it any wonder? Is it any wonder then? Sure, the the harvest is, is ready, but the laborers are few. Well, duh! Have you seen what it takes? Have you seen, have you read what he said? Is it any wonder the laborers are few? I think if it had been me in Jesus' place, I'd have gone about it a whole lot differently. After all, if you want folks to show up, if you want folks to work, you can't make the job sound so miserable, so thankless, so self-sacrificing. No, if you want laborers to show up, you got to make the pay high and the work easy. I remember remember when I was in high school, our school system had a summer job program and offered to kids who were 16 or older, and it was easy work. 
Uh, the hardest thing about it was getting up at 6.30 in the morning or being there at 6.30 in the morning. You'd spend about half the summer washing, cleaning, and waxing school buses. That was it. Paid pretty decent. You'd spend part of the morning, you'd come in at 6.30, they might even have breakfast for you. sweet lady named uh, Linda, I think it was, would make cinnamon rolls sometimes for us in the morning, bring them in, oh, it was easy. You might stroll outside, somebody pulling a school bus, you'd wet it down, you'd wash it, take your time, nobody's in a hurry. You might get done before lunch, they may even buy you lunch. Pull the bus in, nice big industrial fans, boom box, right there. All the cold water and Gatorade you could drink, waxing the outside, sweeping out the inside. It was easy, easy work. And it paid pretty well for a summer job. The work was easy, the pay was high, so of course, you'd have a line a mile long of high school kids trying to sign up. That's the way you do it. That's how it's done. Make the pay high and the work easy, and folks will show up. You know, it makes me think of those times when I was younger, not real young, in rooms a lot like this one. I'd hear some preacher, he might be wearing a tie, might be some young guy who'd pace back and forth, pulpit gone. But I'd hear some preacher shouting and hollering about hellfire and damnation, about the awful state of humanity, about how despicable and disgusting we are all, all are, and how God can't wait to burn us all up in hellfire as black as sin. Oh boy, he'd really get into it. He'd really get going. And then when his face was as red as a tomato, when like his cheeks were going to pop, when his sweat was just pouring through his shirt, he'd say something like, but all you need to do, friends, all you need to do is bow your head and close your eyes and say this little prayer with me. That's it. That's all you've got to do. Man, I can recall those services. Folks I knew who were more saint-like than the Pope himself come squalling like babies down the aisle, kneeling on the steps. I can remember seeing folks who came for their annual dose of religion, making their way down the aisle just to be sure they still had their ticket to ride, paid up in full. All you got to do, bow your head, close your eyes, say the prayer, come down, we'll talk. All you got to do. That's how you get folks to sign up. The pay is high and the work is easy. All you got to do, all you got to do. But just don't tell them. Don't tell them the truth. Don't tell them they'll have to change. Especially the ones who think they've been doing it right for years. Don't tell them they'll have to give something, everything up. Don't tell them it'll cost them. Don't tell them that folks won't like them. People want to be liked. Don't tell them that everybody's going to hate them. Don't do that. Don't tell them, don't tell them that they're going to have to get involved, that they're going to have to make a difference, that they can't stand on the sidelines anymore and just watch the world go by. Don't tell them that. Don't tell them that they have a responsibility for their neighbors, for strangers, for their enemies. Don't tell them that. Just tell them all they got to do is one little... Don't tell them the rest of that stuff. Don't tell them that sometimes they go against God. Don't tell them that sometimes the Bible doesn't say what they think it says. Don't tell them that Jesus may be trying to steer them in another direction. Don't tell them that God is on the side of the oppressed, the marginalized, and outcast. Don't tell them, just tell them, just tell them to get easy, to pay high, to work low. Don't tell them that God loves everybody, because then it doesn't sound real good. Don't tell them that they'll actually have to live the words they claim to believe and put action to their faith. Don't make it hard, Jesus. That's what I would say. Don't make it hard. Just leave it where it is. Tell them it takes an hour or two a week. Tell them it's like working out at the gym. Tell them it's just a cup of cost of a cup of coffee. Tell them it's just a little prayer. Don't tell them the truth. Don't give them the whole thing. Because if you tell them the whole thing, they won't want to sign up. If you want laborers for the harvest, you got to make the pay high and the work easy, or they'll never sign up. Unless, 
unless the Spirit of God lives in them. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. For the work is hard, but the pay is unimaginably high. Let's pray together. Eternal God, our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer. Lord, you call us into the work of the kingdom. You call us, Lord, into the field that is ripe for harvest. And we look around sometimes, Lord, and we notice. We notice, Lord, the laborers are few. Help us, God. To have the strength, the courage, and the faith to endure, to stick with the work, Lord, though it may be hard, though it may seem thankless, though it may be without its reward on this side of eternity. Lord, give us the strength to be faithful in the work you call us to. And Lord, we pray now that as we look out on the harvest, you send workers. Send us, O oh God. Call us even this morning to the work. For the harvest is ready. And Lord, we know the laborers are few. So call us, God. And give us the strength to do what you call us to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.